We're going to be in Acts chapter 13 this morning. We actually got just a couple of, uh, couple of uh, verses in, ver in chapter 12. But if you need a Bible, raise your hand. My brother Bill there would love to put a Bible in. Look at there, you got some takers, Bill? You got some takers? Chapter 13. You know, in chapter 12 last week, we saw God perform what I consider, I don't know about you guys, it was a pretty incredible miracle. Pretty incre incredible miracle as he has Peter escaped from prison. Escaped from prison. Herod the king had reached out to persecute, to persecute the church, come against the church. Herod had reached out to persecute the church, and he started by killing James. Arrested James and had James beheaded. Lopped his head off. Then he arrested Peter. Now he couldn't execute Peter right away because it was, uh, it was Passover and he wanted to respect the Jews or they, so he wanted to make it look like he respected the Jews. So he, he wasn't going to execute Peter right away so he put him in prison. See, Herod was taking out the leadership of the church, guys. You think about it, what better way to take God's church down than take out the leadership? You know, I've never known many, uh, of many senior pastors to fall into sin. Those churches fall apart. It hurts. It hurts a lot. Guys, be praying for me. Seriously, be praying for me. I'm a, I'm a person just like you. There's no difference. He was trying to take out the leadership. See, what seemed like a sure end to Peter, God knows God are now used to bolster the church and bolster them in their faith. Incredibly. But God, you know, I love that term, but God, guys. When everything else is going wrong in your life, but God. God can do his amazing things. And not only that, I want to say but prayer. You know why? Because in verse 5 of, of chapter 12, last week, we said constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. But prayer. God answers prayer. All the church was praying in unison. All the church there in Jerusalem was praying. They were having a prayer vigil. They, it was a nonstop prayer vigil that was taking place for Peter to release him. They prayed and they prayed fervently. You know, the Bible says pray fervently. Are we praying, church? Are we praying in unison? See, the early church knew where their, where their help came from. As it says in one of the Psalms, they knew where their help came from. They prayed and they prayed fervently. God sent an angel, right? Remember that? God sent an angel to Peter and released Peter from prison. He said, you know, slaps him on the side and said, let's go, Peter. Time to go. Let's get out of here. Chained, he's chained to two guards. He's chained to two guards, and the chains are released from him. He gets up, and he walks past two more guards with this angel. And then he gets to the city gates, and the gates open up automatically. And out he goes. Peter didn't know what was going on. He's just woken up from sleep. You guys know how that is. Some people have a hard time getting to church at 930 because, you know, they're still groggy there. <laughs> None of you, though. So anyway, he released Peter. I got to say, he released Peter because Peter's, uh, the prayer of the church was answered. You know, I brought that up last week. Would Peter have been released from prison? Would God have released these chains from him had not the church been praying? Good question. We don't know. Good possibility not, though. Good possibility. His prayer was answered. Nothing excites a church more than when prayer is answered. Nothing, I want to say, builds up a believer's life when prayer is answered. Have you had prayer answered in your life? I have many prayers, and I tell you what, it just it gets you excited. Are we praying, church? The crazy thing happened is, though, is when this prayer was answered for those in Jerusalem, they were astonished, it said. They show, Peter shows up at the house, you know, and... They're blown away. What? God answered prayer? We've been praying fervently. It couldn't be Peter at the door. No, it couldn't possibly be. They said, oh, it must be his angel or something. That prayer was answered. There again, are we praying? Are we asking? Are we praying in faith, expecting your prayer to be answered? We have a dear sister in the church who normally sits right there. 
Normally sits right there. Her name's Marie. Marie is fighting a battle for her life with cancer. I've asked you guys to pray fervently for Marie in unison. That we would pray for Marie, lift her up to the throne room of God. Well, number one, that God's will will be done. And number two, if it is his will, that she would be healed. That we'd be praying. For, in fact, we're going to pray for her right now. Join me, please. Father God, I do lift up my sister Marie to you right now. Lord, and with all in agreement, God, we ask your will be done in our sister's life. We ask God for comfort, comfort from the pain she's going through. We ask for peace, peace in her heart and mind. Anything the enemy may be putting in her mind, Lord, that you would just extinguish it. And Father, above all, we ask for healing, that your will would be done, that you would give the doctors great wisdom as they, as they work on Marie and medications and things of that nature, Lord. And God, and Jesus, if you want to heal her by the touch of your spirit, you go ahead and do that too. We have faith. We trust in you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, do we believe God answers prayer? Do we believe it? Amen. In John 14, Jesus says, in verse 13, he says, and whatever you ask in my name, I, that I will do. He doesn't say, hey, maybe I'll think about it. <laughs> you know? He says, no, that's what I'll do. That the Father, guys, by the way, when prayer is answered, it always glorifies the Father. That the Father in, uh, may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, he says it again, I will do it. Do we believe it? Do we trust in it? Do we believe that Jesus answers prayer, guys? Do we have the faith? I... He says just a mustard seed, right? Oh, he needs a little mustard seed worth of it. Peter was free now. Peter was free. And, and, and we see at chapter, end of chapter 11, as we finished up last week, and I love this part. Well, I shouldn't. It's kind of gory. But this King Herod dies a horrific death. You know, he dies a horrific death. He's eaten with worms from the inside out. Literally, the angel struck him with worms inside him, and he, five days later he was dead, being eaten by worms. Ah, oh, can't imagine that. I'll tell you a story about a dead deer behind our house, but we're going to eat later, so anyway. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that. Herod had made this mistake. He'd made a mistake of proclaiming himself to be a god, to be like God. It was a big mistake. Hebrews 10.31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Let me tell you what, Herod fell into the hands, the judgment of a living God at this time. God doesn't play second fiddle, church. He doesn't play second fiddle to anybody. He's not going to be your backup singer in your band. You know, a lot of people will say, well, you know, Jesus is my co-pilot. No, he's not your co-pilot. He's going to be your pilot. You give him the, you know, and maybe he'll let you steer every now and then, okay? Let's pray, and we're going to go into our scriptures this morning in chapter 13. Father, I do again thank you, Lord. God, that you will uh, open your word to us. What you had to speak to us this morning, God, let it be, uh, let it be edifying to your church. The Lord, as always, I just say more of you and less of me. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of my message this morning is You Can't Stop Truth. You can't stop truth. You know, a lot of people say, well, truth is relevant. Well, church, no, truth is not relevant. Truth is truth, and that's all it is. And you can't stop it. We're going to see that here. Chapter 12, we're going to finish up those first last two verses there. And in verse 24, it says, But the word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. It says in verse 24 that God's word grew and multiplied. Guys, this is what happens. This is what happens when the truth of the gospel goes out. God's word multiplies in, in believers. God, God's word multiplies believers in general. It's what happened when God's on the move, basically. When his, it multiplies. When his church prays, I want to say, God's word multiplies. When they pray, when they're obedient to his word. 
In verse 25, we, hear, we get to see Barnabas and Saul. They're coming back from Jerusalem, right? They had been sent to Jerusalem to deliver a gift from Antioch to deliver a gift, basically, of funds, because the people in Judea and Jerusalem were hurting really bad, and so they gathered everybody some funds, and they sent it off with Paul and Barnabas, Saul, actually, at this time. We're going to see him actually, his name will become Paul in chapter 13. Yeah, his name will be, but Saul and Barnabas, they went to uh, Jerusalem, and they're coming back now, and they returned to Antioch after they delivered this charitable gift, and they bring with them this young man, this is a young man named John Mark. Now he'd be, later be known just as Mark, who writes the Gospel of Mark. This young man they bring back with him. He's the cousin of Barnabas. He's Barnabas' cousin. He's coming with him to help in the ministry. Now, John Mark came from a very wealthy family. His mother Mary in Jerusalem was a very wealthy lady, like some of them I know here. No, I'm sorry. Uh, Am I pointing at you, Faye? Oh, yeah. But they actually, the, the original church would meet in her house. She had a rather large home. And they would meet in her home and, because she had enough room for them all. And, and he comes from a pretty wealthy family. Uh, Well-to-do, we would say. But another thing about John Mark, see, is he grew up in Jerusalem. And so he witnessed many things that Jesus did. And he was there to be an eyewitness of what took place. You see, Saul and Barnabas weren't. They lived in other lands. And so they weren't there, but John Mark, he was there. Chapter 13, let's go off in verse 1 here. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there was a certain prophets and teachers. Guys, when it says prophets, these were men who were speaking the word of God, God. Not foretelling the future, foretelling prophets, but foretelling prophets, men speaking the word of God. There were these certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger. By the way, he would have been a black man called Niger. He was from Africa. Uh, where am I at here? Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had uh, been brought up with Herod the Terarch, and Saul. Saul. So there's five guys. Now this Manan guy, he was, uh, he was brought up with this other Herod, the Terok. That was the guy who had John the Baptist beheaded. So, you know, all these Herods seem to do pretty bad things. <laughs> anyway, so these five guys, and they, uh, they're there in, um, in Antioch. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, Antioch had become a very thriving church, been a very thriving church. And so there were these five men, as I said. There was, there was uh, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manan. And they all taught and ministered within this church. It was growing quickly, and so they, they needed these extra guys. God's Holy Spirit was gifting those with different gifts and different, I should say, gifting those teachers. They were gifting them with the gift of teaching for different men to help and minister to the body there in Antioch. You know, God always provides those to serve for him. God provides those to step up. God provides those teachers. As a church grows, God brings in more that are able to help minister to the body. You know, there's a certain number, I read it one time, and it's statistically wise, and how many people in a church one pastor could minister to. And I think it was right around the 80 to 100 mark. And after that, then another minister. Well, personally, I think that's a lot to begin with, okay? <laughs> I think you need somebody before that. But there's these five guys now. And you know, it was a good reason for them having these five guys. What had begun with Barnabas and Saul, you know, they planted that church, basically, in Antioch. What had begun with them had grown, and it had grown for good reason. It, because God's Holy Spirit was moving, and they're bringing in these other three guys to help out, because some of them were going to be sent out, see? You find that. As God brings others in, you're going to see these others sent out. In verse 2, it says, in a, a time of prayer and fasting took place. You read that there, and as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, 
a time of prayer and fasting, God's Holy Spirit. And they made it clear to Barnabas and Saul, as they were praying and fasting, they were to have a different ministry. They were to leave the ministry where they were at in, in the church of Antioch, and they were to go out. I don't know how many of you have ever been a part of a body of Christ somewhere in a church for a number of years. I know I had. And then it's time God moves you someplace else. It's hard, man. You know, this is, this is Saul's baby, that church in Antioch. He knows all the people there. It's very difficult when you, when you leave a body of Christ in one place sometimes and move to another. Sometimes it can bring you to tears. It did for me and my wife. It was hard. 18 years at Calvary Chapel Prescott. And then God moved us for another six years somewhere else. And then God moved us again. And look where I'm at. Ah, what happened? <laughs> no. That's what God does. You know, I love it in verse 2. It tells him, he says, as they minister to the Lord. You think about, well, wait a minute. How do you minister to the Lord? How do you minister to God? How do you minister to Jesus? You know, the number one ministry of any pastor, any leader, any teacher is first to the Lord, is to minister to the Lord. And you're saying, well, how do you do that? How do you minister? It's personal. It's very personal within them. It's their own time of praise. It's their own time of worship. It's my own time of prayer. It's my own time of coming before the Lord. For any pastor, that's what it is. It's coming before the Lord, the Lord in listening then. See, a great deal of that is listening to what God wants to speak. You know, you know I've got, a, I've got the gift of gab, right? That's, that's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gift of gab. Well, that's fine, but there's times you've got to stop and listen. What is God speaking now? What is he saying? So you minister to the Lord. You honor God. Really what it boils down to is being, as it says in Romans 12, a living sacrifice, church. A living sacrifice before the Lord. Your lifestyle is set to honor God. You want to serve God? You want to be fruitful in God's kingdom? You're looking to head into ministry in any direction. I don't care what it is. Let your lifestyle reflect and honor God. It must. So God is now going to begin a ministry of Saul. The Apostle Paul will know him as a little later here. The ministry that, like I say, was foretold by Ananias many years ago. Guys, it's like 15 years now. 15 years, three years in the wilderness, in the desert, in Arabia, another 12 years back in Damascus. 15 years later, God is now going to start using Saul, who's going to be the Apostle Paul, for his ministry. It was foretold by Ananias. In Acts 9, we read about it. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, before kings and children of Israel. He's going to bear his name before the Gentiles, before the Jews, and he's going to bear his name before very, very important men. And we're going to see that in 13, a very important man. For I will show him how many things he must suffer in my name. Saul had spent so many years waiting on his calling, maybe thinking, maybe I misheard. You know, maybe I just misheard God. Maybe Ananias was full of it, you know. Ananias didn't know what he was talking about. I've been sitting here in Damascus for 12 years, you know, ministering to this little town, obviously. I don't think he wasn't doing anything. He's ministering to the town. But he might have thought, maybe I, maybe I uh, misheard him. Maybe I, I didn't understand what he meant. You know, I want to tell you, whatever God starts, he completes. Be guaranteed in that. Whatever God starts. Philippians 1.6 Being confident of this very thing that He who has begun a good work in you in whatever in you sometimes in a church also He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Will. There's no maybes. There's no ifs. Buts. It's will. Will complete it. Take heart in that. If you're sitting there and you're going you know what? The Lord really spoke to me. I'm supposed to go this way and nothing's happening. You know, all this is happening around me. When God puts a calling on your life, you can be guaranteed that it's going to happen. You know, God put a calling on my life. If you came to uh, pizza with the pastors, was that the way it goes? Pizza with the pastor, yeah. And I shared my testimony. It was 2006 
when God spoke to me. 2006. And he said, it's time. I knew what he meant by it was time. His Holy Spirit then spoke to me on some things I needed to take care of. But then years are going by. Years. Took care of those things God told me to do. And I'm still waiting and I'm going, what's happening? No, be guaranteed. When God speaks it, it will come to pass. Saul, 15 years, man. The, the writer of, I don't know, 80% of the New Testament? My goodness. He sat around a long time. Verse 3, let's move on. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they caught, sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. This young man, John Mark, went with them. Now in verse 3, it tells us that the others sent Saul. See, it says, having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on him and they, and they sent him out. But in verse 4, it tells us who really sent him out, the Holy Spirit. That's who really sent them out. It wasn't this group of, of other guys at Antioch. It was the Holy Spirit that sent them out. In Proverbs 16, church, it says, a man's heart plans his way. Isn't that the truth? We plan our ways. We plan our future. A man's heart plans his way. But the Lord directs his steps. You think you got it all figured out? <laughs> yeah, you laughing, William? You think you got it figured out? No. God directs the steps. Proverbs 20, 24. A man's steps are of the Lord. How then can a man understand his own ways? I'll tell you what. I ask that myself so many times. God, you brought me so far. You've taken me so many places. You've done so many things. I don't even understand. All I do is praise him. I thank him. You know, I've witnessed many good men. Many very gifted men. Very gifted teachers of the word. Very, uh, what's the word they use? Dynamic type teachers. Deny their calling to God. Deny their calling. Leave the ministry. And the, the reason they leave, you know, and I'm not slamming them, they're good friends of mine good friends, but they have a gift. They have a gift of teaching the Word of God. They have a gift of ministering to people. But so many times they leave for a more comfortable life. That's seriously why they leave, for a more comfortable life. A more comfortable life in living, a more comfortable life financially. You know, there ain't no, there ain't no wealth in being a pastor. Trust me. A more comfortable life in not having to I almost want to say answer to God all the time, to ministering to others. It can be a lonely life. It can be a lonely life as a pastor. But they, they left. Very gifted men. You know, God gives us our free will. You don't think Saul could have just stayed in Damascus when Barnabas came to get him? Yeah, he could have stayed there. God gives us our free will. I just hope for you, all of you, if God is pushing you in a direction, if you feel just even a little nudge, that you'll be in His will. Not in your will. Go with it. You know, I tell the kids at juvenile detention, I said, you want to go on the most incredible ride of your life? That's how i got to speak to these teenagers. You want to go on the most incredible ride? I mean, it'll be epic, dude. An epic ride. You grab onto Jesus and you, and you go for that ride. I tell them, you know, I said, it'll be the greatest high you've ever been on. The best drug you ever did. You grab onto Jesus, you grab onto God and see what he's going to do in your life and watch out. In verse 5, it says that they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. Now, what was interesting about the custom of the Jews is it was basically open synagogues. If you came in and you were dressed as Saul and Barnabas would have been as teachers, they would allow you to come in and teach from the uh, pulpit, I guess, if you want to call it that. You won't see that in churches today much. You know, some stranger walks through the door and says, Hey, pastor, I'd like to go up there and teach the message today. And I'm going, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't even know you. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, they were allowed to preach the word of God. 
And they preach the word of God in Solomon. Now, I want to, honey, can you put up that map? Maps help me. I don't know about you guys. I want you to see, ta-da, I'll get down here. Here's where they were in Antioch. And now they sailed from Antioch and they went to Solomus and they were onto the island of Cyprus, basically. And we're going to see then they're, they're going to travel across the island and they're going to end up in this Paphos over here. So if that gives you an idea of what things look like, you know, north, south, east, west, for you geographically uh, struggling, <laughs> it won't matter anyway, right? <laughs> And so it says, as they preached the word of God there. Now, what they were doing was they were taking the Old Testament scriptures, guys, and they were showing Jesus, much like Philip did with the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch. Remember? And the Ethiopian eunuch said, hey, what is this saying on Isaiah? Well, it's saying, it's saying, here was Jesus. It's speaking of Jesus. And they didn't have the New Testament. They were writing the New Testament, right? And so they're showing them, guys, there's a saying, the Old Testament conceals what the New Testament reveals. Jesus was from the beginning, and it shows it all through the Word of God. From the beginning. So they were taking those, and they were, they were speaking them to the men. And see, their assistant, John Mark, he was very valuable. And the reason I mentioned earlier, he was valuable there. Whether he was well-versed in the Old Testament Scriptures or not, but he was an eyewitness of Jesus. He could fill in the voids what Saul and Barnabas was speaking. He could fill in those voids. Yeah, I seen him heal a man. I seen this take place. I heard his words. And so this young man, uh, Mark, John Mark, was a very valuable guy. Verse 6. Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, I showed you that, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius, Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, this Bar-Jesus dude, Elimus, the sorcerer, for his, his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the truth. Now the city of Paphos was known for its great immorality. Incredible sexual immorality, immorality throughout the entire region there. They were idol worshipers. They were pagans. They worshipped the goddess of Venus, the goddess of love. Actually, it was the goddess of sex because their sexual immorality was so terrible there. It was a spiritual dark place, guys. It was very spiritually dark. I don't know if you've ever been to spiritually dark places, but you can sense it. You can sense the spiritual darkness about it. Now, I, I love the town, but I sense spiritual darkness when I go to Flagstaff. I don't know if anybody else here does. I feel spiritual darkness when I'm in Flagstaff. I don't like Flagstaff for that reason. I mean, I like Flagstaff. I like the beautiful area. I go to Sedona. I feel spiritual darkness there. When I was in Nairobi, Kenya, trust me, there was extreme spiritual darkness there. It's extreme. So it's a spiritually dark city. It's no wonder, though, one of the first people they meet is this sorcerer, Bar Jesus, right? What are you going to meet in spiritually dark places? You're going to meet spiritually dark people. What would you expect? You know, I say you go into Satan's lair, what do you expect except to find Satan there, right? I tell men at Bible studies, I said, you walk into the den of a, a lion, don't expect not to be eaten. Guys, be serious. There's places, as a believer, you don't go. Because all that is there is darkness. You know, I used to tell my, my kids uh, when they were teenagers, and they wanting to go out dating, and, you know, they want to go out and or hang out with their friends. And what time we got to be home? I said, 10 o'clock. Well, that's a bummer. Oh, 10 o'clock, all our friends are staying out to 11, 30, 12. I said, no, 10 o'clock. I said, nothing good happens after 10 o'clock. Trust me, I grew up. I, I lived those times. Nothing good. And think about it. Seriously, nothing good happens after 10 o'clock at night. You go someplace spiritually dark, what do you expect, church? You go to Satan's lair. He's going to be there. 
Now his name, Bar Jesus, Bar meant son. He called himself the son of Jesus. That's what he was calling himself. He was a renegade Jew. It said he was a Jew. He was a renegade Jew pretending among the Gentiles to be a worker of miracles just like Jesus. All right? He'd heard about Jesus. He heard about the miracles. I mean, the entire area heard about him. But he was pretending to be like Jesus. He was a self-proclaimed false prophet, a false man of God is what he was. He was a false man of God, a false teacher. You know, there's so many warnings in the Bible. So many warnings to us about false teachers, about false prophets, those looking for whomever will listen, whatever, as they say, whatever ear they can tickle, right? And, and there's so many that are out there still today, guys, still today, much like this bar Jesus, who are false prophets, false teachers, and they're not teaching sound doctrine. In 2 Timothy, Paul warned Timothy, he said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, we're going to come back to that own desires, guys, according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Oh, I've got some teachers over here. And they will turn their ears away from the truth. You can't stop truth, right? And be turned aside to fables. Little fairy tales. They'll be turned aside to that. Their own desires. You know, there's, there's so many out there. And I want to say Christians. I want to say, quote, Christians. They want to choose what part of God's word they want to obey. They want to, they want to like a smorgasbord. Well, I like this, but, you know, I don't like this. I think I'll get rid of this, you know. And trust me, there's some pages I'd like to tear out of here too, all right? There's some things that are like, really, Jesus? Seriously, you told me that? I'm to love my enemy? You've got to be kidding me. I'm to pray for them too? Give me a break. They want to take that, their own desire. See, they want the word to say what they want it to say. And these false teachers, boy, they're good at that. They'll make it say whatever you want it to say. You fill those seats up over there and you drop something in that box in the back. We're all good, you know? Their own desires. Church, it's not a smorgasbord. You either will obey the Word of God or you don't. Now, are we all sinners? Yes. No problem there. We're all sinners. We all fail miserably. But the fact of the matter is you cannot deny the truth. You're not going to stop it. The truth is the truth, church. See, this man, uh, Sergius Paulus, this proconsul dude, he was a very important man, a proconsul. He was responsible for, for an entire region, an entire province, and this was part of Roman Empire, so he's, an, he's a, responsible for this entire area there. He was also, I love it, he said he was a very intelligent man. You know, intelligent men seek truth. Intelligent men seek truth. They seek out that truth. They don't, they don't go, well, what somebody else is saying or what somebody tries to sway them towards, they seek the truth out for themselves, and he was seeking the truth out for himself. See, he heard, I want to say this, if you're intelligent, you know everybody tells you you need to be open-minded. Well, you need to be open-minded, man. You need to hear this, you need to be open-minded. Well, when it comes to things that aren't true, don't be open-minded, be closed-minded. When it comes to things of God that are true, then be open-minded. Open-minded to God. Open-minded to the Word of God. But those other things, just close your mind. I don't need to hear those things. There's a lot of people speaking untruths. Put it that way. Everything's relative. It's all relative. Your truth isn't my truth. Well, no, I'm sorry. There's only one truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So he's a very intelligent man. And he had heard about Saul and Barnabas. He'd heard about them. Knew they were in town. Thought he'd kick it back with them for a while, you know. Check out Saul and Barnabas. Hear the message they were going to speak. He wanted to hear more. He wanted to know more than what he just already heard by hearsay, right? So he called for them. He wanted to search the truth out for himself, church, is what he wanted to do. He wanted to search the truth for himself. In verse 8, it says, But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them. 
seeking to turn the proconsul away from the truth. Oh, of course. See, this sorcerer alignment, Alimus, he was friends with the proconsul. He didn't want the truth of the gospel to get to him. He's going to, you know, change his buddy, proconsul Sergius. Sergius Paulus. I don't want the gospel to change him. His high-powered friend. He didn't want it. He wanted the status quo, the status quo to stay the same, right? He wanted it to stay the same. He didn't want his friend, he wanted his friend to be ignorant of the truth. He wanted to be ignorant. And Limus needed his buddy Sergius to stay just the way he was. A sinner, just like him. One who didn't, didn't seek Jesus, didn't truly seek God. He wanted to be just like he is. Stuck in the same old life. That's where he wanted them. He wanted them stuck in the same old life. Guys, there's many out there. That's exactly the way it is. Exactly the way it is. Friends that will keep you back from the truth. What are you going to church on Sunday for, man? We could go fishing. We could go boating. We could go water skiing. Why are you doing that? You know, what are you going on a Wednesday night for crying out loud? We can go over to the bar and hang out and tip back a few. There are those who will just keep you from the truth because why? Why do they keep us from God? You just need to hang with me, man. Why don't you just hang with me? Much more fun. Hang with all of us, you know, a whole gang of them. Have a good time. They keep you from the truth. Because, you know, if you're living a life of a Christian, if you're truly living a life of a Christian, and walking a walk that Jesus called you to do, when you hang out with them, what does it show them? It shows them their sin. They don't want you hanging out there. You're going to mess them up. You're going to mess my friend up. Oh, Alimus, he didn't want Ser Sergius, he to be messed up. He wanted to have a good time. Matthew 10. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 10. Jesus makes it real clear here. Matthew 10, verse 32. Page 1402, if you have one of the church Bibles. Same as mine. Uh, Matthew 10, verse 32. Jesus says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever pronounces Jesus as their Lord and Savior before other people, Jesus will confess them before the Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. You ever deny Jesus? I tell you what, I'm I'm ashamed to say in sometimes not necessarily verbally, but in what I've done, yeah, I have. And I'm probably not the only one. I will be, if you like. I'll be the only one who's ever denied my Lord and Savior by the by my own behavior and the way I acted. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, to confess Jesus in our lives... It's in our walk. It's not so much in our words. I don't know that there's anybody here who would just deny Jesus flat out in front of somebody's face, but you deny Him in your walk. We must show it in our lives. The way we carry ourselves with our friends, our families, our co-workers, those people who are around. By the way, Jesus doesn't hate family makes it sound like, wow, if you love your dad more than me. No, what Jesus is saying, I want to be number one. I want to be number one. 
You know, how many times have you denied Jesus by your actions and what you say? You know, today we're having this baptism. And all of us who witnessed those baptized professed to follow Jesus and confess Jesus the rest of their lives. We are, I want to say, almost their accountability. We are witnessing that. We're witnessing that in them. That they're going to profess Jesus. Like I say, he doesn't hate family. He just wants to be first. Or at least he doesn't want to be denied, church. At least he doesn't want to be denied. You don't understand. Sometimes we're not as bold as we should be. That's normal. You know, we're kind of a little timid. Not gonna, not gonna put it in somebody's face. At least not deny him. For I have come to set a man against his father. See, this Alimus wanted to be the first in his buddy's Paulus's life. Sergio, he wanted to be first. He, wanted, he, couldn't, he couldn't let God interrupt his position there. He wanted to be first. Verse 9. Let's move on. Go back to the book of Acts. Then Saul, who was also called Paul. Hey, by the way, did you see what happened right here? Bam! Saul is called Paul. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of deceit, all fraud and all fraud, you son of the devil, you. Well, I said that. You son of the... You. You enemy of all righteousness, you will not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord. And now indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately dark mist fell upon him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Now we see in verse 9, Saul, like I say, he became Paul. Now this is what I believe. We're going to see that he actually brings salvation to Sergius Paulus. This was the first highfalutin, important person that Paul ever did convert. I believe that he adopted his name, Sergius Paulus, which is Paul. I think he adopted that name at that time for that reason. I could be wrong, but I think that's what happened. I think he took his name of this prominent convert that we're going to see him convert in just a few here. Paul lays into Alimus with both barrels. Dude, you son of a devil, you. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are keeping this man away from the truth? Who do you think you are? From hearing what's right, from hearing the truth, to hear about Jesus, who do you think you are? Like I say, there's so many today that try to do the same thing. Keep people from hearing the truth. Paul was on fire with the Holy Spirit. He calls him, you enemy of righteousness. This is why, like I say, you enemy of righteousness. Guys, I hope there's a little bit of righteousness in your life. You really understand, we don't have righteousness on our own. We have righteousness in Jesus, right? Our righteousness is in Christ. So many want to have you back in the world because your righteousness will show their sin. Will show who they are, and they don't like that. They don't like that picture. They they start feeling dirty. They feel dirty, and so they don't invite you to the parties anymore. Nobody invites me to parties anymore, man. I'm a great guy to hang out with. I don't have to drink. I don't have to smoke something to hang out with you. You know, I'm. Well, that guy speaks about Jesus, though. You know, he's going to speak about Jesus. He's going to talk about some God things or something. So he don't get to go to parties anymore. It's sad. It's interesting as you read here the, the curse that Paul puts on Elimus, right? It was the same curse that Jesus put on, on Saul where he blinded him, right? He blinded him. He couldn't see any longer. <laughs> We've got to finish up here. Verse 12. Then the proconsul, it says, believed. So Sergius believed. When he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. He'd seen this sorcerer, Alinus, get blinded. All right, that's pretty amazing right there. All of a sudden, oh, I got to see. After uh, Paul lays into him, 
seen that take place, but he was also astonished at the teaching of the Lord. He witnessed first a false prophet, a sorcerer, be blinded by the power of God. I want you to know that was the power of God that blinded him. You know, Paul didn't just throw something in his eyes and go poof, you know. A little trickery, no, the power of God blinded him. And he also seen at that time, as Paul was speaking to him, he seen this man standing in the way. Remember, he's an intelligent man. He's an intelligent man. And so he's seen him standing in the way, this alignment standing in the way of the truth. And he said, wow, there's something too. But then, then Paul shared the word of God with him. And it astonished him. He was astonished by the teachings of Paul. He was astonished by the word of God. Guys, are you still astonished by God's words? Are you still astonished? Does it amaze you? I know it does me all the time. I'll be reading the scriptures. You know, the, in Ephesians it says the, that the, um, the word of God is living and powerful. It is truly living and powerful. I mean, there's some scriptures that I read last year and they, they don't hit me the same as, wow, today it speaks right to, my, right to my life, right? It's living and powerful. He was astonished by the words. I hope you are astonished by God's words. Does your relationship with Jesus excite, excite you like it used to? Your relationship with the Lord. Is there excitement in it or is it just like, you know, darn it, my wife is making me go to church today. I really didn't want to go to church today. They got good cookies and coffee, though. So that's the only thing good about it. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, does your relationship with Christ, does it excite you like it used to? Have you become, here's a huge word for you, I love this word, lackadaisical. Try to spell that one by yourself without spelling correct. It doesn't work. Have you been lackadaisical about your relationship with God? I mean, seriously, just lackadaisical. Don't read your Bible. Don't pray. Don't truly really seek the things of God. You're just kind of there. Show up at church and get a little fire insurance, you know. That's what they call it. For those who aren't truly serving God and they're not, uh, they're not seeking God, it's just, you know, well, I'm, I'll stay out of hell. I'll get some fire insurance anyway. I'll accept Jesus. Have you become lackadaisical to the point where, like I can say, your relationship is just meek at best, just small at best? Or maybe, maybe you don't even have a relationship with the Lord. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're going, what is that guy speaking about up there? Who is that dude? He's been speaking now for 45 minutes. 45 minutes. And I don't understand what he's talking about. Maybe you're one of those. Maybe you don't have a relationship with the Lord. Maybe you haven't accepted Jesus. You know those getting baptized this morning? They're saved. They've accepted Jesus. They're just pronouncing that to the world. I want you to, uh, honey, if you bring down the lights, I want you guys to bow your heads. If your relationship with the Lord has waned, you're wanting to come back. You're wanting, you're wanting more power of His Spirit within you. You're looking for a, to be astonished again by the Word of God, and the power of God, and Jesus' Word in your life. I want you to say a prayer along with me here. Just in your hearts. Father, I know you as my Lord and Savior, Jesus. I know you. But God, I really haven't been walking the walk that you have called me to. In fact, I've even denied you sometimes, God, in the way I live. Jesus, forgive me. I'm a sinner. Forgive me and clean me up. Re-excite me. Re-excite my life, Lord, towards you. And maybe you don't even know Jesus. 
Maybe you're here and somebody brought you by. Maybe you're just here to watch a baptism. I don't know. But you've heard something. Something has touched your heart. And you want to accept Jesus for the first time. The very first time. That you may begin this relationship. And then he can bring you that excitement of knowing him. I want you to pray something like this. Lord, I come to you. I know I'm a sinner. I know, God, that I have sinned and fallen short of any, any reason that you would love me. But God, I confess my sin before you. And Lord, I want to tell you this morning, I believe. I believe in your Son. I believe for the work that He did upon the cross that I might have eternal life with You, Lord. I believe, Lord. God, forgive me of my sins. That Your Son, Jesus, would You come inside me now? Would Your Holy Spirit fill me? That I'll be a believer today. In Jesus' name. Amen.